Good morning. How are all you keto freaks out there who on this fad diet that's been around since the dawn of humanity? I'm Dr. Dwylandell, a cardiovascular surgeon. I'm really honored to be here today. I got my uh, lockdown uh, shave going on, and uh, unfortunately, Robin didn't have hair and makeup for me, so you're going to have to take me the way I am. I spent the good part of my adult life in the cardiovascular operating room. Uh, I've done more than 5,000 coronary bypass operations and thousands of other things on the lungs and blood vessels uh, all around the body. So uh, in a way, I was like a man with a hammer. Uh, everything seems like a nail. Uh, I did 5,000 of these coronary bypass operations, wherein we would take an artery from inside the chest, or a, a vein from the leg and detour around the blockage on the coronary artery. Uh, say, we, I really didn't care what caused heart disease. I just knew that if you had it, I could fix you. I could return into your family, get back to your life, back to work. And uh, it was a pretty gratifying deal to be able to do that. As I say, I was like a man with a hammer. Everything looks like a nail. Um, I didn't care what caused heart disease because I was busy. I was building a career. Mark Train called this the law of the instrument, where it's our natural tendency to be over-dependent on our narrow skill sets. Uh, but at least I was trying to make my hammer better. Now, the heart-lung machine is an absolutely spectacular device that saved millions of lives but it had side effects. Um, there was a certain number of people, two to 5% of people had a stroke, uh, 60 to 70% had cognitive impairment, sometimes permanent, but most often temporary. So some of us felt that if we could do this operation without stopping the heart and using the heart lung machine, it would be better. Now, I wasn't the first, but I was a very, very early adopter of this technique because I thought it would improve our patient's outcomes. With the partnership of industry, we developed some nice little instruments which enabled us to stabilize one small area of the heart and let the rest of it keep beating. You know, much like a sewing machine that stabilizes the uh, fabric for just a moment while the needle goes through and back and ties the knot. And then with the uh, aid of, once again, of industry, this cute little suction cup, we could lift the heart up and do the blood vessels on the backside of the heart. So we could do a complete revascularization without using the heart lung machine. And uh, indeed we had better outcomes. My partner and I did 1000 consecutive coronary bypasses without a single stroke. So we saved a whole lot of people from having a stroke and a whole lot of people from having cognitive impairment. Now, once again, I say I didn't care what caused coronary disease early in my career, but as I began to see people coming back for a second operation, they had normal cholesterol for their second operation, they had normal cholesterol for their first operation. And I began to wonder what really is causing this disease because it didn't seem quite right. This study came out a few years ago, and it's 136,000 patients admitted to hospital with a heart attack. And here are their LDL cholesterol levels, the so-called bad cholesterol. More than half the patients were below 100, and 70% were below the, the 130 mark, which was what was supposed to be uh, the treatment level at that time. Now, depending on how you got treated was mandated by what was called the adult treatment panel. And this was his third edition. Now the adult treatment panel is made by you know, 12 uh, professors or, uh, of uh, cardiology. And they get around, have a meeting, look at the evidence and uh, recommend at what levels we should treat cholesterol. So this was their iteration and this was the uh, standard at the time which every physician had to follow. Now, just about this time, we were talking about changing to what's called a risk calculator, um, which was controversial, but uh, there was a lot of pressure to go to the risk calculator from this. Now, 
if you had half your patients with normal cholesterol, one might think maybe it's not cholesterol, but no. What we really did here was say that we need to switch to the risk calculator and we need to push cholesterol levels even lower. There was a big study and uh, the mantra became uh, lower is better. But uh, Stephen Nissan, the most prominent cardiologist now who works at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, in commenting about the LDL targets and the risk calculator uh, says this, the science was never there for the targets. Past committees made them up out of thin air. Now that's a pretty damning statement about the whole treatment of LDL targets, but uh, that didn't deter him. He was still uh, committed. And uh, he said this a couple of years ago, we're losing the battle for the hearts and minds of our patients to websites developed by people with little or no scientific expertise who peddle natural or drug-free remedies for elevated cholesterol. This internet driven cult denies statin benefits and stirs up fears of side effects and then profits from the resulting confusion. Well, I guess I'm a statin denier and a cultist and uh, because if I look at the literature, the number needed to treat with cholesterol medications is at least 99. That is 99 of the patients will get no benefit. One might get benefit. This was a massive study of 11 different trials who said you might live three or four days longer if you get treated with cholesterol med uh, medications, uh, statins. Uh, I recommend all of you uh, search out this article and look at it. It's sort of the definitive uh, beatdown of the idea that LDL is the cause of heart disease. I highly recommend you find that article. Current market for statin drugs is a trillion dollars worldwide. And the doctor visits and treatment and lab tests probably is four or five times that amount. That's a lot of money to waste on a, what I call a fake disease. So the American Heart Association, as you know, is uh, at the forefront of making these recommendations, including statin treatments. Um, they've been at war with saturated fat for a very long time, uh, starting at, at their origin. Uh, the Heart Association does a lot of good. I will give you that. Publish a lot of journals, have a lot of awareness. They uh, got started with a few cardiologists early in this last century because there was no heart disease. And it was a very small organization. But in 1949, it decided to convert itself to a charity. And uh, Procter and Gamble, the maker of Crisco, the first uh, artificial fat, uh, gave them the revenues from a radio show, which got them one and a half million dollars and really got them started on becoming what's now the largest volunteer organization in the country with an annual budget of about $900 million. But they still won't go off of this saturated fat idea because they're never going to bite the hand that feeds them. Uh, this was the recent advisory about a year and a half ago, once again, uh, saying that saturated fat was evil, bad, will raise LDL, will cause heart disease, although there's not a single metabolic pathway between, <coughs> excuse me, saturated fat and uh, LDL. <coughs> but they persist. Now let's do a little case study on cholesterol. This is a 75 year old man. His uh, total cholesterol is 300. His LDL is 198. Uh, his cardiologist has a heart attack every time he sees these numbers. But this particular patient has had these same numbers for 40 years as long as cholesterol testing has been around. Uh, it's important to know his family history. His grandfather, his father, his mother, his older brother, all died of severe coronary artery disease. So here's a man with horrible lipid panel and a very strong family history. Well, he had a little episode of chest pain and had a cardiac catheterization. And this is his left coronary artery, 
completely normal, no blockages, no narrowings of any kind. This is the left system from the anterior view. Once again, no lumps, no bumps. This is the right coronary artery. Uh, once again, completely free of disease. So these, as you can see in the corner, happen to be my pictures. So with that family history, I'm asking, uh, you know, am I adopted? <laughs> well, I wasn't adopted. It is my family history, but in 1972, I was doing a trauma rotation in Dallas, Texas at the Parkland Hospital where President Kennedy died in that very emergency room. And I was getting really fat eating free chocolate milk and donuts every morning after rounds. And I picked up a diet book and I read it and I thought it was right. And although I've never been super strict about it, and I've never been really skinny. I did apparently just enough to have normal coronaries at my age with that horrible family history and those evil lipids. So I think uh, I will have to say wholeheartedly, thank you, Dr. Atkins. <clears throat> now, as a medical student and a resident, and this, this is a few years ago, we were taught to completely trust the medical literature. If it was published in the literature, it was true. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. This is the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, our most prominent journal in this country. No longer possible to believe much of the clinical research or the guidelines. I'll let you read it. Uh, it's a sad commentary. This is the editor of The Lancet, Europe's most prominent uh, medical journal. He said it's much the same. Much, probably half, is not correct. Uh, John Anatovis from Stanford says 90% is incorrect for a variety of reasons. So basically, we have been betrayed by the medical literature. There is so much money to be made in big pharma and big food that they really have taken over the medical literature. And uh, it's no longer can be trusted. You have to be very careful and make sure that the study is uh, repeated and is correct before you believe it. This might be uh, the state of events. Uh, they've done half the work. Uh, all you have to do is provide the data at the front. So, uh, and I'm amazed that I look at, as I look at studies that come up, you know, across my desk, how bad a lot of them are. It's horrible. Now, what's the first thing I'm going to do? Quote you the medical literature. <laughs> now, this article was published in uh, 1999, and it's the seminal article about inflammation and atherosclerosis. What causes heart disease and inflammatory disease? Russell Ross. Uh, did this, he's a pathologist, uh, but he assembled all the evidence available to that time, all the mechanisms, all the cellular mechanisms, all the biochemical mechanisms were all worked out, and he elicited them very carefully. Uh, sadly, he had to give homage to LDL cholesterol in this article as a possible cause of inflammation, otherwise he wouldn't have got this article published. The other sad thing is that he died shortly after the publication of this, and we've lost his wisdom. Now, inflammation follows injury. So did we ask what causes injury? No, we ask how can we develop a drug that will suppress inflammation? We spent hundreds of millions of dollars on clinical studies trying to prove that statins were an anti-inflammatory medication. Uh, and that got to be the idea. So now we can treat people with normal lipids and elevated C-reactive proteins with statins. And that increased the population eligible for statins dramatically. There's now a clinical study going on with a powerful immunosuppressant that we use in transplantation, trying to limit the inflammatory response. What could go wrong? Now, Here's what really happens. 
And here's visually what Dr. Ross had put out and what has never been refuted and is only being reinforced over the last uh, 30 years. This is a blood vessel and the endothelial cells line all 60,000 miles of our blood vessels. In the presence of inflammatory cytokines, the endothelial cell uh, secretes an adhesion molecule which traps the white blood cell, the monocyte, and invites it to come into the subendothelial space. Other cytokines convert that monocyte to a macrophage, which is really our special forces cell. It, its job is to go out and destroy anything abnormal. Well, LDL is, comes and goes uh, through this uh, endothelial layer in the subendothelial space on its way from the bloodstream to the tissues where it's used. And only if it's abnormal will this macrophage consume it. So it has to be either oxidized or glycated because the macrophage does not consume and destroy normal uh, molecules. So that's, uh, that's how it gets started. Now, a collection of those overloaded macrophages becomes a foam cell, and a collection of those foam cells become what's called a fatty streak. Now, I've seen thousands of these when looking inside the coronary artery. Once again, this is just a, a depiction of what happens. The foam cells become a fatty streak, then that becomes a plaque. If the inflammatory process continues, that plaque can rupture and uh, occlude the vessel, and then we get a heart attack or a stroke. So inflammation is present from the very beginning to the very end of heart disease. Now, once again, what is causing this inflammation? And why is it narrowing the artery? This is the Banting Lecture, which is given every year uh, by the American Diabetes Association, honoring Dr. Banting, who discovered insulin. Now, this lecture in 2004 was given by Dr. Michael Brownlee. And for him, this was not just scientific, it was personal because without Dr. Banding, he would have died at eight years old when he developed type one diabetes. So for him, this is both scientific and personal. Now he asked the question here, what is unique about certain blood vessels that they get destroyed by diabetes? The blood vessels of the kidney, the eye, the peripheral nerves, and indeed all small vessels all around the body are affected by diabetes, which is characterized by high blood sugars. Now, he identified four pathways that the damage occurs. What happens to, the end of, to all of these cells, the unique thing about those cells in the eye, kidney, nerve, and small capillaries, and even big blood vessels, blood vessels for that matter, is that they cannot defend themselves against high glucose. Other cells can say no because they have what's called a GLUT4 insulin receptor. The capillary uh, of the endothelial cell does not have a GLUT4 receptor and it cannot say no. So it is at the mercy of blood sugar. And so the, whatever the level of glucose is in the blood, that's the level inside the endothelial cell. And <clears throat> like any chemical reaction, it's uh, motivated by the number and uh, reactivity of the reagents on either side of this reaction. So what happens is the pyrrole pathway, when too much glucose is in, the pyrrole pathway gets overloaded. Protein C kinase gets overloaded. The hexosamine pathway is overloaded. And we make advanced glycation products, which uh, change fats and proteins irreversibly uh, throughout the body. But he brought those all down to one common, uh, common uh, factor, and that is the overproduction of superoxide in the electron transport chain. Now, before you uh, get scared, I'm not going to ask you to memorize, uh, like you did in college, the Krebs cycle, the glycolytic pathway, or even, even the electron transport chain. But what happens when we pour all that sugar in is that we get these precursor molecules, NADH, 
and FADH2, they're poured into the electron transport chain in quantities that it's not prepared to accept. Now, these are all electron donators, donors, and the electrons jump from one, two, three, four. And in doing so, they produce enough energy that protons, hydrogen molecules, are pumped into the inner membrane space. Then when they come back, we produce ATP. Well, what happens when these are, uh, normally this would end up being water. The oxygens would accept and they would uh, be united with the proton again and make H2O. What happens when we overload these is that the electrons get stuck in the CoQ enzyme before complex three. Complex one, complex two, donate the electrons here where they sort of wait for a signal. Now, when that's overloaded, there's nowhere for these electrons to go except to be uh, create oxygen free radicals. And these end up damaging the cell, damaging the DNA and all the rest. Now, if you damage your endothelial cells, think about it. Everything that comes in or goes out has got to cross this endothelial cell, either through the cell or in spaces between them. Oxygen, nu nutrients, and then all the waste products have got to go through here. <clears throat> Normal glycemia. I mean, I've called the endothelial cells the, really the brains of the cardiovascular system because they control blood flow. They control where the blood flow goes. They control whether it clots or doesn't clot. They control uh, new blood vessel formation. The dysfunctional endothelial cell can't do those things properly. And uh, we end up with what's called endothelial dysfunction. And we end up ultimately with cell death and blocked off artery. Now, I once gave a presentation calling this the most toxic molecule on the planet. Uh, people kind of laughed. You think of toxicity, you think of snake venom or strychnine or some of those things. It takes a very small amount to kill you. And when we talk about toxins, there's what's called LD50. That's lethal dose the lethal dose that will kill half the uh, recipients. Now for those other botulism and those kind of things, the LD50 is in very, very small amounts. It takes about four to five pounds of sugar to kill you, to kill half the recipients. So in those terms, it's not very toxic, but in terms of the number of people it kills, nothing else kills as many worldwide. Heart disease is still the biggest killer worldwide, in spite of everything that we've been scared of with pandemics, they're, they're really minor compared to the number of people who are killed by glucose. And I've just explained why glucose is the cause of heart disease, injuring the endothelial cell and uh, starting the inflammatory cascade, which allows the lipids to be collected and cause a plaque. Now, we're talking, uh, supposed to be talking about ketosis. Well, here we are. Mainstream medicine has finally discovered ketosis. Normally, if you talk to a physician about ketosis, they would immediately uh, start yelling about uh, ketoacidosis, which is, was our only association with the idea of ketosis. So this came about because of the development of the SGL2 inhibitors for the treatment of diabetes. They cause uh, the kidney to excrete the sugar instead of reabsorbing it. And uh, all of these good things happen. Blood pressure, in, uh oh, increased LDL. Well, we'll ignore that for now because the FDA has approved these drugs to, for diabetes treatment and prevention of coronary disease. So this study showed that the ketones went up generally by 0.3 to 0.6 uh, fat oxidation up. Guess what? If you get low sugar, you oxidize fat. If you get low sugar, you make ketones. Drop the sugar utilization by uh, 20%. Now, when the marketing people got a hold of this, Oops, sorry. Uh, they say a 14% reduction in cardiovascular events, 38% reduction in cardiovascular deaths for diabetes on Jardians. 
35% reduction in heart failure. Well, indeed, there is some improvement uh, in the cardiovascular health with these, but it's only about one or 2%. These are what's called relative risks. And relative risk is just another way to lie. It's the real difference is one or 2%, much like statins, about a 1% difference. And yet they claim 36% reduction in cardiovascular death. So uh, although they're important drugs and uh, they come with their own set of side effects uh, by having a lot of sugar in your urine, uh, genital infections and a few things uh, happen. And I don't know why uh, the idea of peeing out sugar is so attractive and the idea of not taking the sugar in is so repulsive to the medical community. Now, the endothelial cell doesn't use a lot of energy. So I can't tell you that being in nutritional ketosis will help the endothelial cell dramatically. The best thing you can do for your endothelial cells is keep your sugar normal. The worst thing you can do is have uh, chronic and intermittent high sugars. <clears throat> Other tissues, which you lose a lot of energy, like the brain, the heart, the liver, they absolutely love to burn ketones. In some experiments, the, the power, the ejection fraction, the amount of blood the heart pumps out with every beat was up dramatically when ketones were given. Uh, you'll have other speakers talk to you about how good it is for the central nervous system. So uh, ketones are absolutely wonderful for all of these things. They may or may not be as dramatic in helping the endothelial cell. But if you're on a ketogenic diet, your sugar's low and you're helping your endothelial cells. I called it cardiovascular glucotoxicity. Now, we have lots of other speakers and I have great respect for them. We talk about insulin resistance. And that bothers me a little bit because it puts a name on a condition. And a very wise professor when I was a medical student said the worst thing that can happen to a patient is a diagnosis. Well, I was puzzled. I said, why? I thought that's what we're supposed to do is make a diagnosis. And he said, when you make a diagnosis and put a name on it, everybody stops thinking about what's wrong. Now, insulin resistance, insulin resistance is real, it's important, but it's only caused by one thing, chronic, carbohydrate poisoning. Now, these are the three C's of poor health. Before we had Coke, Corn Flakes, and Crisco, we had very little diabetes, we had very little obesity, and we had generally uh, much better health. Your highway to poor health is built on hyperglycemia, so all of you continue uh, to study and practice uh, ketogenic diets. So, Thank you very much. It's been an honor to be here. I'm privileged to be associated with uh, this group, with so many high quality uh, presenters and so many high quality attendees. So thank you very much.